Hi, it's Splinterverse. In this video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into a Dungeon Master's Guild product called Jarlaxle's Bag of Everything. It's 130 pages, and at the time of this recording, it's priced at $19.95. It's got a ton of character options, all focused around the Underdark. Always can use more of that, so let's take a look inside. So first, let's talk about the creator. It's from Paper Miniatures, the publisher, but it's got a lead designer of Gary Simpson, as well as several other designers involved. Gary's also doing some of the artwork, which is awesome. But you can see here from the contents that they've got a, a similar pattern to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, where they're going into the subclasses with optional class features. A lot of the subclasses, you have two for, for the class, which is fun. Then you've got some lineages or races, a lot of these will be familiar to you if you know about R.A. Salvatore's work or uh, past Underdark writings. Then you've got um, a, a section called Magical Miscellany with some magical phenomena, a ton of spells, a ton of magic items. And then down here in the Dungeon Master's tools, you've got uh, some environment stuff, Underdark environment information information on spelunking regions and then even some encounters so we're going to bounce around a little bit through the title today and uh, thankfully it's all bookmarked so that you can easily do that and uh, let's just take a look at the sorcerer so here you can see it starts with the optional class features and then it goes into the sorcerer's origins which would be the subclasses and that pattern is something that is repeated for each of the classes so if you enjoy just general optional class features this book's going to have a lot of those for you and it's 130 pages so here it's got some additional spells uh for you at, at, you know um, uh, right off the bat it's adding spells to the spell list for sorcerer which is nice and and that seems to be a common theme with the spellcaster classes in this book and then you've got something called soothing sorcery for third level, it says when you use meta magic to restore spell slots, you regain hit points equal to twice the number of meta magic points spent. Then under seventh level, they have persuade reality. It says your natural charisma can bend even the forces of nature to your will. You may use charisma instead of wisdom as your skill check for animal handling, nature, and survival. So those are fun little variations that you can try out uh, they had things similar to this and in wizards uh, tasha's cauldrons of everything so if you're looking for more of those there's a ton of those in this book then over here you've got your sorceress origins and there's there's quotes from this jarlaxle character throughout the book which is fun nice little little formatting similar to again tasha's which i like uh, so we'll read a little bit here about the deep diviner Deep diviners have an intimate connection with the land around them, particularly with the stones that make up the earth upon which they tread. These sorcerers harness the power of earth and stone to fuel their spells and can channel powerful energy from earth nodes that follow them through the battlefield. Deep diviners are often found living solitary lives apart from the rest of the world. These reclusive mages are content to remain hidden away with nothing but earth and stone as their companions, but can be roused to action if their lands are threatened. Though they do not often become adventurers, those that do are staunch and reliable allies who remain firm and unshakable in their resolve and values. So some nice lore to go into the background of this deep diviner definitely connects to the Underdark because they're talking about the land around them and stones and all of that stuff. So you can see how they're tying it in there. And it's nice that it's not so hardcore you know underdark specifically so you can maybe make this uh something you know a character that lives in a cavern system that's not the underdark right so very cool so at first level you get earth's defense you can channel the strength of the earth through your body bolstering your defenses when you are hit with a me melee attack while not wearing armor you may use your reaction to cover your body in a rock hard carapace increasing your ac to 14 plus your dexterity mod fire until the beginning of your next turn and possibly causing the triggering attack to miss and then you've got stone slinger it's another first level feature you learn the magic stone cantrip if you did not already know it additionally when you deal bludgeoning damage with a spell or cantrip you may add your spell casting ability modifier to the damage dealt so 
get a little extra cantrip action there. Earth Node, six level feature. You learn to harness the energy of Earth Nodes, small outcroppings of magical stone buried just beneath the surface that only those deeply attuned to the Earth can sense. So again, tying in to the themes of this subclass, I like that. As a bonus action, you may summon an Earth Node, which appears at a point you can see within 30 feet of you. You and creatures friendly to you gain the following bonuses when you are within 10 feet of any number of Earth Nodes. You have a plus one bonus to AC, you have advantage on constitution saving throws. Your melee weapon attacks have plus one to their attack and damage rolls. So some cool stuff there. A node is medium in size, has an AC of 20, etc. So it talks into how your, how your node um, has its stats. And then elemental transformation, 14th level. Your connection to the earth allows you to channel its power through your body. You learn the polymorph spell if you didn't already know it and may use the spell once per long rest without expending a spell slot to transform into an earth elemental. You may also transform yourself into an earth elemental when you use a spell slot to cast polymorph at fifth level or higher. So cool little polymorph action. And then you've got improved nodes, so building upon your 6th level ability with your 18th here. Your mastery of your earth nodes increases. You now gain an earth node whenever you cast a spell a 4th level or higher, and you may use a bonus action to move 2 nodes up to 30 feet in any direction. You may also use a bonus action to have a node fire off stony projectiles targeting one creature within 10 feet. Make a spell attack against the creature. On a hit, it takes damage equal to 1d6 plus your spellcasting ability modifier. Additionally, your nodes now impose the following penalties on hostile creatures in addition to their bonuses to your allies. When a hostile creature comes within 10 feet of the node for the first time in a turn or starts their turn there, they take magical bludgeoning damage equal to your proficiency bonus. The space within 10 feet of the node counts as difficult terrain for enemies. Enemies within 10 feet of the node have disadvantage on saving throws to maintain concentration on spells. So lots of stuff. You get these little nodes that, that are magical and buried just beneath the surface. So that's kind of fun visual uh, thing to have. And that's just one, Deep Diviner. And then you've got Lolth's Blessed is another, um, another uh, subclass for the Sorcerer. And, and that's just one class we're looking at. As, as I said, there's a, there's a ton of uh, character options here, especially for classes. And then let's look at the backgrounds. You've got the web weaver, the bounty hunter, and the heretic, and the slave, and the miner. So lots of them. And, uh, and then you've got a ton of feats. So let's go look at some of the spells. So clarity of mind, third level abjuration. For the duration, you or a willing creature you can see within range has resistance to psychic damage, as well as advantage on enchantment and illusion spell saving throws. So yeah, that might be a good spell if you're dealing with, uh, you know, something that's causing a lot of psychic damage, or maybe trying to charm you, do a bunch of um, uh, shady stuff to you. You can get this clarity of mind going and and maybe prevent that. There's one in here I wanted to look at in particular, oozing wall. So it says you raised your hands toward a solid vertical surf surface and utter an incantation. The wall is covered in a 20 foot square of ooze. The ooze has tendrils that all creatures within five feet of the surface must make a strength saving throw against the spell save DC of the caster. On a successful save, the creature is not grappled by the wall. On a failed save, the creature is grappled. While grappled, the creep creature will take 1d4 plus 1 acid damage at the beginning of each of its turns. So kind of a fun um, ooze representation, which is cool, especially if you're underground or dealing with this uh, underdark stuff to have uh, something kind of like an ooze to deal with here. It's um, also got at higher levels where the, the, the damage increases. So and it's a conjuration spell. So fun there. Now let's take a look at a magic item. So we've got Aboleth Eye here. The glassy red eye of the feared Aboleth is a rough, is roughly the size of a fist and has a squid-like pupil and holds sinister intent even though its body is long since dead. Very cool. And it's a very rare item. While attuned to the Aboleth Eye, you are considered to be under the effects of the non-detection spell and can gain resistance to psychic damage. Your body has 
does become somewhat aberrant upon attuning to the eye, perhaps manifesting in ways such as a thin layer of slime covering your body, vestigial gills, or a third eye appearing on your body that moves with a mind of its own. Breaking attunement to the eye does not reverse the effect. Only a removed curse or greater magic can return to your, your body to normal. And there was another one I wanted to look at real fast here. Let's see, where is it? Um, the gelatinous cube armor. It's armor heavy, very rare, requires attunement. This armor is made from sculpted chunks of a gelatinous cube, ooze that scours dungeon passages, leaving a perfectly clean path in its wake. Due to the pieces of the gelatinous cube armor still being biologically active, the armor has the following traits while worn. Your max hit points total is reduced by one hit dice. A creature that touches you or hits it with a melee attack within five feet of it takes 1d10 acid damage. Each time you use this trait, the armor loses one charge and it has 10 charges in total. So fun uh, call to the gelatinous cube monster and uh, you get some armor that's kind of still alive a little bit. And then there's all kinds of stuff like low swarm, heated armor, illithid earworm, illithid squidling. Uh, so lots of magic items in here for you to discover. And then looking over here at the, at the tools, you know, there's the geology and environments, the underdark environment, spelunking, various regions. But let's take a look at some of the encounters. So you've got... Uh, a friend in need it says a soft blue glow emanates from the clearing head. It appears to be coming from the tentacles of several small stock eyed saucers floating above an injured friend. One of these creatures notices you and glides over curiously while its tentacles turn from blue to green. This cloister of 2d6 flumps grieves over their friend who was gored by a minotaur. They are not aggressive, but defend themselves if necessary. The curious flump telepathically asks the party for help. The injured flump dies in 10 minutes unless saved with a medicine check or five points of healing. If saved, it recovers and rises off the ground. The grateful flump undulates a spectrum of color and accompanies the party on their travels. Flumps are susceptible to the evil thoughts of others turning red when such thoughts are detected within 60 feet. So that's a fun, flavorful little encounter with a flump. And then the flump can, uh, you know, join the party, fly around, maybe when give away something in the sense that if, if somebody's having evil thoughts, it turns red. And so then they know that this NPC is having some uh, evil thoughts just by how he's turning red. If they figure out, out, you know, what's going on with this flump, because who knows if it, if it can communicate <laughs> at all. So, um, Fun little, and that's just the first one. There's a bunch of Underdark encounters in here because, again, this book is 130 pages, so that's a significant amount of content and looks like it was very lovingly made by this team and has a lot to offer. So hopefully you'll check it out using the link in the video description and give it a try. If you've got a title you'd like us to consider for a video review on the channel, Please see the video description for a link to our Google form where you can submit your title. We can't promise we're going to cover every single title we receive, but we do appreciate receiving them and having the opportunity to consider your work. If you'd like to support the channel, consider purchasing one of our books. We've got Van Richten's Librem of Lineages with tr truly unique lineages for any setting, as well as optional rules to help you deal with lineages in your campaign. And we've got Potions Unlocked, which is over 100 pages in both digital and print-on-demand format. Tons of new potions with a short story for each one explaining its origin, as well as potion locations, plants, etc. There's even a magic school in there where you can learn to do potions so it's perfect if you're using Strixhaven. And we've got the Feywild Companion, which is over 150 pages of Feywild fun for both DMs and players. You've got complete adventures, encounters, brand new creatures, lots of fey creatures, as well as a subclass for every single class, spells, magic items, you name it. It even includes rules on how to alter monster size and keep them balanced. Then we've got Fizzbend's Vault of Draconic Secrets, tons of dragon themed player content with a subclass for each class draconic gifts, magic items, trinkets, 
and adventure hooks to tie everything together for the DM to uh, incorporate all the new stuff in the book into the campaign. Or if you're just a player, you can use those adventure hooks to maybe fill out your backstory as well. So we hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave us a comment. We'll respond to all those comments. Follow us on Twitter at Splinterverse and stay tuned because we have so much more fun D&D content headed your way. And until next time, happy adventuring.